My name is Jim Flynn. I'm the international president of the Global Peace Foundation. And we're discussing here today with Dr. Nicholas Eberstadt. He holds the Henry Wendt Chair in Political Economy at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington, D.C., where he researches and writes extensively on demographics and economic development, and also specializes in international security in the Korean Peninsula and Asia. Dr. Eberstadt, welcome. Thanks for inviting me, Jim. Uh, we're here in Seoul for an, a forum on, on the, the International Forum on One Korea. Just, just to start with, it, it, there's a, a long history and background on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, Liberation Day marks the, the day in uh, 1945 when Japan surrendered, and uh, then hence uh, Korea was liberated from Japanese occupation. Uh, our viewers may know that it was three years later in 1948 uh, that the peninsula was divided. Uh, and so those decisions and those uh, facts from many decades ago have had uh, large implications on, on this region. Uh, could you uh, sure. share with us your thoughts about why it's important to understand what's happening here and how it affects our global sure. situation? It was, a, uh, it was a tragic and unintended consequence of the victory in World War II that made for the lasting till now division of Korea. Um, in, uh, in August of uh, 1945, when Japan surrendered, there was a sort of a basically administrative conceptual demarcation line notionally drawn across the peninsula, which was supposed to be only administrative for the processing of Japanese surrender by U.S. forces in the south and Soviet forces in the north. It's supposed to be completely temporary. Of course, this hardened into a Soviet zone and an American zone, and as you say, three years later, instead of having the uh, election for all Korea that was supposed to be coming under U.N. supervision, uh, we saw the emergence of a North Korea a DPRK, Democratic People's Republic of Korea, under Soviet influence, and the Republic of Korea, today South Korea, more under American alliance and influence. That situation hasn't changed, even though the Cold War that gave birth to it has ended. There's no longer a Soviet-US confrontation, but yet there still is a North Korean-South Korean standoff. Uh, there was the infamous Korean War started by the North Korean side to attempt to unify the peninsula by force. The U.S. intervened, uh, the United Nations intervened, uh, Chinese volunteer troops intervened. It was actually the Third World War, but it didn't end the world. Mm -hmm. And now we have a situation in the peninsula where there's been the fantastic fluorescence of the South the economic success, the movement towards constitutional democracy, the gruesome situation in the North, uh, but there's still no peace. There's still only a ceasefire. And what we're talking about is how to get beyond this towards the one Korea that was intended from the very start. Uh, perhaps many of our viewers have never been to Korea. Uh, and here we sit in Seoul, which is a highly developed uh, city and society. Uh, could you speak to a bit about how uh, the economy and the, the development of the South uh, has, has proceeded and how that is in stark contrast with the North? Sure. Uh, well, uh, many people have described the South Korean economic fluorescence since uh, 1945 as a miracle on the Han River. Here in Seoul, we're on the Han River. That's the reference there. Uh, whether or not one sees it as being miraculous, it certainly is absolutely extraordinary what's happened here. Uh, at the end of World War II, uh, South Korea, the southern part of Korea, was one of the poorest regions in the world until the late 50s, early 1960s. It was as poor as many places in sub-Saharan Africa. 
after the Korean War, it was devastated, was desperately dependent upon U.S. foreign aid. It looked for a while as if uh, South Korea would never free itself from U.S. foreign aid. Uh, President Eisenhower famously talked about the rat hole that he was pouring foreign aid down. That was the miracle on the Han that was about to happen. Um, in the 1960s, there was, a, uh, there was a military junta. There was a big change in policy. And with the big change in policy towards export orientation, uh, all sorts of things suddenly came together in place. And there was a burst of economic growth that was one of the fastest and longest that any country has seen in post-war history. Now we're at a circumstance where this aid recipient society has joined the OECD, the club of affluent democracies that are giving others foreign aid. South Korea's health levels now, in terms of life expectancy, exceed that of the USA. South Korea has become a knowledge producer and has one of the most highly educated populations of any society on the planet. It's an absolutely extraordinary history. The situation in the North is uh, gruesomely different from this. North Korea, Northern Korea, the Soviet zone, then the DPRK, was the area in which most of Japanese colonialism's heavy industry had been located. North Korea started out with an economic advantage over South Korea. Its per capita income was higher. Its productivity was higher. That seems extraordinary to people nowadays who look at the gap there. Um, but North Korea got stuck. Uh, because of its extraordinarily high militarization, uh, before there were nukes, there was a big conventional army that was uh, in place, intended, I think, to take South Korea back again for, for a long time. Um, there was the distortion of the Soviet-type planning system. There were other sorts of terrible errors, I think, that the dictatorship made in its economic management. And it became very dependent on Soviet aid in the 1980s. This regime which extolled its self-reliance and its independence was actually desperately dependent upon Soviet blockade. So when the Soviet system came to an end, North Korea went into an economic tailspin. It almost looked like a death spiral. There was a absolutely ghastly famine that occurred. We don't know how many people perished of starvation, hundreds of thousands certainly. Um, and since then, the North Korean leadership has been struggling to uh, build a nuclear threat, uh, which I think has political significance for the regime, and maintain a, uh, a survival or slightly better than survival level of uh, sustenance for its population. Uh, so you can com two completely different directions for the same people. And the people in the North are the same people as in the South. It's not that they're any less talented or any less potentially productive. Sure. So what you describe here is uh, the one Korean people uh, finally liberated from Japanese occupation uh, and uh, having a a bright opportunity to create their unified homeland at the end of World War II, uh, found themselves by 1960 in two dramatically different realities, uh, and frankly, on, on very different trajectories. Uh, so that, that uh, uh, I think it's important for, for uh, those outside of Korea to understand on this peninsula, there's, there's one people, but you have two dramatically different systems and realities juxtaposed. Uh, I, I often find it amazing to think that we're sitting here in Seoul and, and a, a vibrant uh, uh, modern economy and, and society, and some 30, 40 miles away is the demilitarized zone, and then this totally different reality in the North that you described. Uh, during our deliberations here in the conference, we were talking about the prospects of a final uh, a unified Korea, that, that these two, 
two separate entities on the peninsula were never meant to be permanent. Uh, when there's discussion about, about unifying uh, North and South Korea, uh, lots of questions arise. One of the very common ones is how, how is it possible, or is it possible that these two very different uh, economic realities and societal realities could, could integrate? Could you speak to your sure. thoughts on that? Sure. Well, as you, uh, as you emphasized, Jim, this is the same people with the same culture and the same heritage. It's the same population that's been tragically separated. Um, the reintegration of the Korean people and the reintegration of a one Korean economy would bring a lot of benefit to the peninsula and I think to the region and the world under the right sorts of conditions. Um, there are lots of different ways that unification could take place. The North Korean government had one concept for unification that it rolled out literally with tanks in June of 1950. I don't think that that concept of liberation has much promise or attraction to people in the South. It certainly doesn't have much economic potential. If we could see an end state where the Korean people were living under an open society and a democratic constitutional rule and a sort of a market system, uh, it's apparent, it's manifestly apparent that the opportunities for people in the North would be immeasurably better than the suffering that they endure today. The question for people in the South, for voters in the South, is how much is it going to cost them? How much is it going to, how much is it going to take out of their pockets to help their brethren across the DMZ in a long-term program of reintegration of the, uh, of the peninsula? And honestly speaking, the temperature in the South on economic reunification really chilled about two decades ago during the financial crisis of the late 1990s that some may recall. The situation was so um, worrisome in the South that the ROK had to take out an enormous loan from the World Bank and the IMF to write their international finances which they did, and economic progress continued. But after that experience, many people in the South started to worry, if it cost us this much to fix our own ship, what in the world is going to happen if we uh, have to pay some of the bills for a reconstruction of the North? And those apprehensions, I think, were reinforced by the way that German unification came about. In my view, some of those worries are unwarranted because the uh, federal German government proceeded with a, an approach to reunification that was taxpayer heavy. It didn't have to be taxpayer heavy. They chose that for a variety of political reasons. But clear, clearly there'd be a lot of difficulties and it would take an awful long time to bring an equalization of these societies that have become very economically desperate. But the vision and the opportunities are clearly there. Dr. Eberstadt, you were describing the potential costs and major costs of eventually unifying the peninsula north and south, given the great disparities of those economies. Uh, one thing to, that I wanted to ask you about, uh, I noted that you, you were a founding board member of the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea, yes. and obviously uh, have a serious concern on that issue. So. Uh, in terms of, of understanding costs and benefits, if we look at a, a, a large uh, other parameters uh, that beyond just the economic cost of yes. reunification, that if, if uh, that process were also to address the human cost of the violation of human rights and also the, the incredible cost uh, in security uh, matters as it relates to the nuclear mm -hmm. issue, uh, does, that, does that not offer a, a uh, a more comprehensive view, and what, what is, what's your, your oh, take of, on of that? Co of course, the economics of the 
the direct economics of reunification is only one of the many important aspects with regard to human security and human well-being that would have to come into consideration. Uh, there's human security, which is sorely lacking in North Korea at this point. There's the question, as you mentioned, of human rights. There's the ramifications for regional and global security. Uh, all of these could, with the right auspicious sort of approach, I think uh, generate extraordinary benefits. I wouldn't call them necessarily directly economic benefits, but human benefits to the peninsula, the region, and to the world. I should also mention that if a Korean reunification that involves a successful reintegration of the economy, it's probably going to have big spillover benefits eventually for the region and the world as well. Um, one way of looking at this, I think, it's a bit simplistic and schematic, but I don't think it's wrong, is to think of the economic reconstruction of North Korea, because that's mainly what we're talking about here, as if it were one big gigantic project. Yeah. Uh, it's going to take a lot of capital and investment. It's going to take a lot of time. But as we know with big projects elsewhere, if you have the right rate of return on your investment, the project pays for itself. So the critical question from an economic standpoint would be having a positive business climate having strong, reliable, predictable institutions, including rule of law, property rights, other things, which would make it possible not only to unlock the value in human beings in the North, but also to augment the value in human beings. I mean, one of the things which is most remarkable to me about what's happened in South Korea has been the tremendous generation of human capital over the last three generations. The improvement in health, the improvement in nutrition, the improvement in education and skills. It's that human capital rather than capital in the ground that's made for the wealth that we've seen explode here. And if we can have a framework that's extended to the north that does the same sort of kickstart then I think over the, over maybe a considerable period of time, but over a period of time, we'll see the same thing happen. But what we should know for starters is with a good framework like that, there are going to be immediate dramatic benefits for people in the North, immediate dramatic benefits. I'd like to follow up on, on your, your point about human capital. Uh, Global Peace Foundation is advocating an approach we call the Korean dream approach. Mm -hmm. Uh, and focuses on the end goal uh, of a uni unified Korea, uh, a new nation of high ideals. Uh, this year, uh, 2019, is the centenary sure. 100 years uh, since the milestone activities here in Seoul of the Korean yep. independence yep. movement. Uh, and uh, that aspiration for, for Korean people, like, like many peoples around the world, is, is for a homeland that fulfills their sense of, of purpose and destiny uh, as a people. Uh, in studying the independence movement, I, I know that some of the leaders then were, were calling for uh, a, a mindset among the Korean people to connect to their sense of identity and purpose uh, to, to realize uh, a nation of, of high ideals. Uh, I know also that, that uh, during the period you mentioned uh, earlier in the 60s, uh, there was uh, uh, really a, a, a sense of a national sure. determination to kind of lift up uh, out of the out of poverty and and transform the the nation. Uh, so my question is the the uh, importance of of this uh, sense of a purpose, a sense of vision 
uh, motivation of that mm -hmm. uh, hu uh, human element mm -hmm. of the equation and what that, that could, could play in terms of, of a, a different reality here on the sure. peninsula. Well, uh, well, national cohesion is a quantity that can help in nation building, can help in forming a platform for the social capital, uh, and can make for a sort of a springboard uh, or a foundation for economic advancement. Um, then what becomes terribly important, I think, is the sorts of choices and decisions that uh, a society and a free people make about how to advance. One of the reasons that South Korea, I think, was able to uh, advance so extraordinarily rapidly is because it made the choice to be integrated into the world economy. It didn't turn away and say, we're going to have an autarkic, inward-looking experiment with industrialization or whatever else. Um, being involved in the world economy as South Korea did turned out to be a tremendously positive learning experience because trade and finance and investment isn't just a process of you know, uh, transactions with cash. It's a learning process. It's a vital, dynamic learning process. And South Korea was able to uh, continually advance with this and also to change its laws, to change its policies as it reached different stages where, uh, where there were new sorts of opportunities for, uh, uh, for productive integration with the world. So certainly, certainly the ROK, the people in uh, South Korea, have a very strong, proud, nationalistic sense of self. But there's also a globalized, cosmopolitan aspect as well, which has been part and parcel of the wealth and prosperity generation that I think has worked so very well here. So, uh, because, because uh, people around the world have come to know about Korea, uh, mainly because of the security threats and the nuclear threat of nuclear attack in, in the last number of years, uh, to, to consider that, that there could be a very different reality on the peninsula is perhaps far from people's uh, thinking. But uh, if you were to uh, uh, look toward the future, if it were possible to solve these problems, if it were possible to have a, a uh, unification process uh, on this peninsula that addressed those kinds of issues, what kind of positive, uh, what kind of outcomes would you see? How would the region change and how would, how would that benefit the world? Well, we're being optimists here and sure. we're looking for a best, uh, uh, a best outcome. If we had a best sort of uh, outcome, we'd have a peninsula that was free and uh, probably in an alliance with the USA and um, democratic and market oriented. This would have not just benefits for the peninsula, but a lot of spillover benefits for the region as a whole. It's possible, although I wouldn't want to try to sell it on this, it's possible that that sort of a spillover would include positive influences on security and economy in neighboring Russia and China, which not to put too fine a point on it are authoritarian and totalitarian systems respectively. Um, it would, it would, in addition, I think, make for a circumstance where um, there could be there could be much learning by example from the reconciliation that would be occurring in the Korean Peninsula. There are still some ingredients, obviously, that are missing, and there are 
Uh, there are questions that I don't think even policymakers have thought through carefully enough or nearly carefully enough. It's not at all too soon for policymakers here and in the United States and in Japan and elsewhere to think about what they could do to increase the odds of an economically successful reunification. Because the more preparation goes into that, I think the more likely the odds are that we get to the successful outcome that we want. And uh, one, final, one final question. Uh, again, based upon your long experience and concern about human rights in, in North Korea, uh, in some ways, uh, it's a forgotten part of the world. It's, it's more in the spotlight now, but mostly on, on the nuclear issue. So uh, could you just speak to, to, speak to our, our, our global audience? Uh, why is it important to care about the human rights situation in North Korea? And what, what can people do to sure. raise awareness about sure. that? I think, it's, uh, I think it's crucial as human beings uh, as sentient human beings to be concerned about the welfare of other human beings. And the human rights situation in North Korea is worst in class in the world at the moment. I would not suggest that it is more dire than in war-torn, uh, strife-ridden, famine-ridden regions at the moment. But for any population under a stable government, stable presiding government, there is nothing as dire as what the people of North Korea suffer at the moment. Uh, the Stalin-style system that North Korea inherited at the end of uh, World War II has been perfected into an even more oppressive system. If you want to know why people don't defect from the North in the sorts of numbers you might imagine, you should know that anybody who defects has their families put in their gulag. They've got, their, they've got oppression with Asian family values in mind. It's very effective. Um, so if we look at what, uh, if we look at the way the North Korean government oppresses its people at home, we should realize that that's only one side of the coin. It, the other side of the coin is the international nuclear threat. The same logic that animates the threat to turn Seoul into a sea of fire animates the government to oppress its people at home. What that makes me think, and what I've been committed to for many years, is understanding that human rights isn't just some add-on in thinking about Korean problems. Mm. Uh, if you don't think about human rights in North Korea, you're probably not going to successfully solve the nuclear crisis either, because they're both emanating from the same calculations of the same government. As we're, as we're concluding, Dr. Herbstad, is there anything else you'd like to share with our viewers? Well, I guess, uh, I guess what I'd like to leave your viewers with is uh, a little bit of information about a committee that I'm involved with, the U.S. Committee for Human Rights in North Korea. Uh, this committee has been uh, at work for not quite 20 years, but almost 20 years. It's a very small organization, but we see our, uh, our role as doing research on the human rights problem in the North, because we believe that if people in the peninsula and in the United States and in the rest of the world understand the realities of the human rights problem in North Korea, that will be the first step towards the spotlight that is needed for addressing these problems. Great. And let me say, Dr. Eberstadt, that uh, we at the Global Peace Foundation are quite familiar uh, with the work of the U.S. Committee on Human Rights in North Korea and greatly appreciate uh, the efforts that your team there are making on this very critical issue. Well, I'm, I'm honored to be a small part of the work that they do. Yeah. My name is Jim Flynn, Global Peace Foundation. I want to thank Dr. Eberstadt from American Enterprise Institute for joining us today. Thank Thanks you so, so much. much for inviting me. Yes.